There you go. You're all good. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, let me get set up here. Share. And then check, check, and share. Okie dokie. So, and then just one second. Well, where'd it go? Show panel, here we go. All right. All right, well, I'm really excited to, to share this. A um, little nervous, I haven't taught in a while, but um, uh, I'm, the reason I'm so excited to share this is because um, this is something I feel like, you know, the Father and my Lord Jesus, you know, they've really been working on this in me for a while. And, um, and there's still a lot of work to do, but, um, but now that they're opening up my eyes to this, it's really changing the way that I see everything. And so the, the title is Dying to Self to Stay Faithful to Our Father and Our Lord Jesus in the Face of All, the, all That Competes for Our Faithfulness. And um, so, I mean, if I could just title it, retitle it in one word, it would be faithful or faithfulness. And so the, the goal or the objective uh, for the teaching uh, is that the result of this teaching would be that our thinking and our actions, our life's purposes and our plans, our daily prayers would be interrupted such that we would shift our focus more and more often to what God wants. And there's a lot of ways in scripture where God, um, sometimes, you know, there's an idea that he wants to teach us. And there's different ways that he says that. And one of the ways that us caring about what he thinks, about what he wants, is communicated in Scripture is in the Lord's Prayer. And so, you know, it starts off, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Um, and the other day, uh, I don't know, a couple of days ago or so, there was a, a, a post that Riley put. Um, uh, sorry, Riley, I didn't ask your permission to share this, but... Um, uh, I thought it was just so perfect for what I wanted to share. So I'm just going to share a little bit of what he wrote. Uh, he quotes Galatians 5.17 and says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Uh, the true Christian life is all about doing, and then this is what he wrote, uh, is all about doing what God wants over and above what we want. A true follower of Christ must always remember that only through laying down one's will to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father is the only way to be his disciple. The first thing is to fully realize uh, this through actual experience, what it is fundamentally to disown, to disown oneself. We don't stop having desires, but we choose to live by the Spirit and do the will of God over and beyond our own wills. This is true service and love for God that we walk in his commandments. This is the kind of life and service God is pleased with in Christ Jesus. And what uh, really stuck out to me in the, the post that he put was choosing what God wants over and above what we want. So this kind of flies against or in the face of modern day Christianity, uh, what I termed me Christianity which is where the focus is on ourselves. Um, a lot of sermons are about, well, what can God do for you? And certainly God does want to do a lot for us, but uh, the message of scripture is that, you know, the purposes and the plans of God are much bigger than us. And so one of the things uh, this last time reading through Matthew and some of the gospels that really stuck out to me is that Jesus did not follow his disciples, but he called his disciples to follow him. They were called to leave their lives for his sake and for the gospel's sake. He didn't say, what are your life goals? What will satisfy you? He called them to lay, he taught them, uh, he called them to follow him and he taught them what, what that meant. And ironically, even though self-satisfaction and self-fulfillment are not the goal uh, in life, at least that should not be any of our main goals, the most meaningful satisfaction, I believe, does come from faithful service and obedience to God. Um, 
And also when we're living our lives like that, there's, you know, they're, they're suffering. Like it's, I don't remember if it's first or second Peter, where it basically says you're going to suffer one way or another, but if you're going to suffer, let it be for doing, uh, for doing good, for doing what, you know, the will of our father and our Lord Jesus and not, you know, just whatever suffering comes from following our own agendas. So what is faithfulness? Um, <clears throat> In a word, it's obedience, but I wrote down it's an attitude accompanied by action that focuses on consistent prioritized service. Um, and how do we prove our faithfulness? Well, it's kind of similar to commitment. We have to give our time, our money, and prioritize it at a certain level uh, in, our, in our life. Now, I'm sure there's other things as well, but those are the three things that, that, that came to mind when I thought of faithfulness. Um, so... You know, if you look around the world, you know, there's different people. And, and, and if you look in your own life, I know I can look in my life um, at different times where I wasn't living for any real purpose. Uh, we're just, you know, just kind of trying to get from day to day. But a lot of people, even Christians, you know, really sadly are just killing themselves, you know, working 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week or more. And f not for the purposes of God, but just so they can obtain something that has nothing to do with God. Um, and so it's kind of like, I, I picture, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I really want to win this race. And so you go to the wrong place and you run the wrong, you run really, really hard and you get to the, you know, the end of the race and you realize, oh, geez, the, the race was somewhere else. I was run, running the wrong one. And that's definitely not what we want to, you know, get to at the, at the end of our life or when Jesus comes back. So coming back to this prayer, in Matthew 6, there's, you know, seven or eight parts to the prayer, depending on how you divide it. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence, a coincidence that the first three focus on God and what he wants, his perfect will for our life. Uh, the last five focus on us, but even those five, they focus on our basic needs and what directly affects our relationship with the Father. And what's really interesting, if you look at those, those five things that that um, Jesus uh, mentions when he's teaching the, his disciples uh, how to pray. All five of them are good things. You know, give us our daily bread, forgive us our debts. As we, uh, as we forgive our debtors, um, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But as wonderful as those five things are, if, the, if we don't, if they're not in the context of the first three, which is, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let me bring glory to your name, Father. Uh, your kingdom come. I want to be a. I want to be co a co-worker with you to make your kingdom come. Uh, I want to work with you to make your will be done. It, outside of the context of that, you know, they they don't really have. Not, not even near the, the importance or the value that they do. Whereas, if those three things really are on our hearts. And so these powerful words, they can be a prayer, but they can also be an overall attitude and overall aim and focus of our life. And I believe that these, these, uh, these three things that, that begin the Lord's Prayer, um, like I said, I, there's other sections of Scripture where Jesus or Paul or, basically says the same thing uh, in, in different words, that our number one focus needs to be on being faithful to our Father uh, and to our Lord Jesus, there's a really uh, there's a really cool story that was posted on Facebook not too long ago, and it's it's a little long. It's not really that long. It's just long for Facebook. Uh, it was about 26 minutes long, and the latter half was really the most powerful. But there's an ex football player um, who apparently I'd never heard of him, but he at the time that he played not too long ago, he um, he was the highest paid center in the NFL, and he was on uh, he was about to sign a $35 million contract. But he was starting to have uh, what he called a midlife crisis, I guess a little young at 27. And he, he's, there's a phrase, it was a prayer. He asked God, what would you have me to do? Uh, and so I won't get into his story, but I thought that was just such a cool story and uh, such a cool phrase, a great prayer to pray. What would you have me to do? And kind of like all the, some of the praise reports today, we're just about that, asking God, what does he want? So often, I think that's a, a prayer that we, that we forget to ask, at least um, in Christianity as a, as a whole. 
uh, here in the United States, or at least what I've experienced. So I'm not going to go over all four of these areas that this attitude uh, can apply to, uh, but I just wanted to mention them. Uh, so the four areas that, that I wrote down that this can apply, where we can apply this attitude, apply this, um, this shift in our thinking, is when we're facing a difficulty, whether it's our own failures, our insecurities, conflicts in relationships, that's a really big one. Um, success, you know, sometimes success ends up bringing people down because they start getting arrogant or, you know, we're tempted to be arrogant or to start taking our focus off of the one who gave us the success. Uh, anytime we're making a big decision or anytime we're giving counsel, like I think somebody mentioned earlier, you know, so, so many times we seek counsel in the body of Christ and what does God want isn't, isn't even put on the table. Um, and not, it's not always on purpose, I don't think, but, but nonetheless, it's, it's something that, that we need to keep, I think, at the forefront. And so one way to, um, to summarize this, again, I said that I believe this attitude is, is said in different ways throughout Scripture. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, um, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. I think in the NIV it says uh, we make it our aim. And so I'm going to ask for a couple of readers that I'll kind of alternate through a couple of passages. Uh, you can have your Bible. That's fine. The, the passages will also be on the screen. Uh, can I get a couple of volunteers to read? Yeah, I'll read for you. Okay, so Dustin will be reader one. Somebody else will be reader two for me. And Julie. Okay. So Dustin's reader one and Julie reader two. All right. So uh, Dustin, can you go ahead and uh, this is from the NASB uh, Mark 8, 31 through 38. Can you read that? It's kind of a long bullet. Okay. And he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, adversary, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. Actually, that's, that's good right there, Dustin. I'm sorry. I made that a little longer than it needed to be. And the rest of that's really, really great, too. But that, that kind of gets the main point. Thank you. Uh, so things you don't want to hear from Jesus. Get behind me, adversary. Um, but what was really neat about, uh, about this section that really stuck out to me, you are not setting your mind on God's interests but on but on man's you know i i find it interesting jesus doesn't call him an, a loser or an idiot he doesn't start to berate him but he, the point is still so powerful you know you're not your mind is not on god's interests but on man's and i i thought if jesus you know when jesus words started bothering peter what what would he have said if his thoughts had been interrupted by the prayer that I think he actually, he probably should have known, um, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. You know, here's Jesus telling him about what's to hap about to happen to him. And what if he had been interrupted by those thoughts? I, I think he would have said something differently. And, and that's, that's the goal that our thoughts that we can be interrupted by, by this. Um, it doesn't have to be this exact prayer. There's many other scriptures, but this idea of, it's all throughout scripture of what is what does God want? What does our Lord Jesus want? What would they have us to do? Um, and kind of a side note. Um, eh, forget the side note. Let's let's move on here. Um, reader number two, can you uh, Julie, can you read um, this section here, this bullet here for me? For okay. us. Um, Romans, Romans one. one, okay. Um, 
Okay. Um, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Thank you. Um, so actually, I, that side note, I'll go ahead and mention it now. You know, sometimes, you know, there's always consequences of focusing our life on ourselves. But sometimes we can be consumed by ourselves. You know, sometimes we can get kind of get away with just being mediocre in our uh, quest to be to fulfill ourselves. But sometimes it can lead down a a rabbit hole that can be really hard to get out of. Um, but what I wanted to point out here is these people that Paul's describing are people that knew God, but instead of honoring Him and being faithful to Him, they they didn't do that and. So thus they foolishly exchange the glory of God. And if you really sit down and just take that phrase, the glory of God, they exchange, what, what in the world could you possibly exchange that for that would be worth it? But yet there are things coming at us, you know, advertisements and, and so many other things, uh, distractions that, are, that, that do compete or try to compete with the glory of God and with the truth of God. And they would have us, you know, either worship or serve those things or those people instead of our creator. Um, and so, uh, let's get past that. So, Dustin, can you, read, uh, can you read from Mark 10 for us? Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Thank you. Um, so again, you know, I mentioned earlier, there's so many people who are, they're sacrificing a lot, but it's not for Jesus' sake and it's not for the gospel's sake. And that's what, um, you know, G again, Jesus was constantly, constantly trying to inspire faith and faithfulness in, in, the, in the 12 disciples and anybody who was listening to him. Um, and so here's just another way that, that, that he says it. Um, Julie, can you read this one from Matthew 26? It's uh, verses 51 to 54. Okay. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? And that question at the end, th thank you, Julie, um, was what I thought was so powerful. You know, Jesus, how can, you know, he's about to be crucified and go through so endure, uh, so much for us and his his focus is still on the scriptures need to be fulfilled god's will needs to be fulfilled and i'm going to go ahead and read this one this is um luke 14 uh and 57 through 62 really flow well together but i'm just going to read 57 and 52 and so it's uh, in verse 57, well, I guess I'll just read 50, uh, 62. In verse 57, somebody comes up to him saying, hey, I want to follow you. And Jesus responds, um, basically saying, this is not an easy thing for you to do. 
And in verse 62, he says to him, no one putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, we need to stay, not only become committed in the first place, but stay committed to the work and to the will of God. Um, so here's another one uh, in Luke 14. Um, let me see here. Dustin, go, can you go ahead and read these, these couple of bullets for us? Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Can we keep going? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't read the. Oh, um, your well, that's okay. I, I I probably can read most of it. Okay, uh, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, "This man began to build and was not able to finish." So then. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions, all his own possessions. And again, you know, uh, thank you, Dustin. This, this last time that I read through these, um, which was, I don't know, about a month or two ago, um, I was reading through Luke, and, I, and I'm almost certain I've read Luke, you know, more than once, or at least once. And these verses just hit me so powerful. They, we cannot be his disciples if we don't prioritize Jesus above just about not just about above everything in our lives uh even our own life uh even up to all of our own possessions so what's competing for your faithfulness what's competing for your allegiance not all things that require commitment or faithfulness are a bad thing but even good things that require our commitment and our faithfulness um our allegiance can compromise our commitment and our faithfulness and our allegiance to the to our creator and to our Lord. Um, and so the second half of this, you know, sometimes we'll hear truth from scripture, at least this happens for me, but then how does it apply to, to day to day living? Um, isn't always so obvious um, usually cause you know, I get in the way. Um, so what does faithful being look like, uh, look like, like we said earlier, faithfulness requires um, perhaps among other things, but certainly our time, uh, money often, and definitely it needs to be prioritized at a, at, at a high level in our life. And when it comes up to God and, and uh, being faithful to our God and to our Lord, that needs to be number one. Um, so so just, there's just a few things that, that compete for our faithfulness that I wrote down, and I'm sure we could add to the list, but uh, sometimes, you know, our family our, our spouse, children, parents, siblings, friends require some level of, of, of faithfulness. Those, those relationships do. Our culture. Uh, there was a really neat. Um, I, I quoted this uh, or I copied it. It was in uh, Michelle put it in the comments last year, last um, not last year, last uh, Sunday. Culture runs deep and requires the light of the word to see the hidden recesses of sin in it. Uh, our government, political parties are definitely competing for our faithfulness. Uh, our jobs compete for our faithfulness. Uh, they'll say things like, uh, you can't work here anymore <laughs> if you're not faithful. Um, our daily responsibilities, I'm, I think of, you know, the, the situation with Mary and Martha, you know, certainly there's nothing wrong with cleaning your house, but, you know, if Jesus is there, then maybe you should, you know, put that to the side. Um, and then, there's a lot of useless things like millions of advertisements that are coming at us on a, on a regular basis. But the one that I really want to focus on is our, our desire for other things that Jesus talked about in this, in the parable of the sower in particular, uh, serving ourselves. So if we refocus and daily refocus our life's plan and our life's purpose on those words from the prayer, hallowed be your name, father, your kingdom come, your will be done. And how, and I want my life and the fruit of my life to, to work with you in those endeavors. Um, it can really 
change very positively the outcome of our lives and and the how powerful the fruit of our lives is uh, another and just again other ways that this is in scripture is Jesus said you know we, we need to be setting our mind on God's interests and not on our own um, and or another way to put it is forfeiting our will for Jesus sake and for the gospel's sake or as Riley put, wrote down in the in his post doing what God wants over and above what we want if we do these things then all the things that are trying to compete with God's glory, that are trying to compete with God's truth and for our faithfulness to them, they, they'll either be exposed as one, to be the will of God, or two, to be inferior to God's will, or three, to just be flat out evil and, and, and not good at all. And so these are, um, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, these are just some examples from my life recently that um, I feel like, you know, I think we uh, we can all think of examples, or I hope we can all think of examples of how does this play out in our own life. And so for me, um, and I'm not trying to push legalism here with eating, like you can't eat anything that's sweet or anything along those lines. But um, the other, you know, I'm sure you could say this of many places, but schools are really not a good place if you want to eat healthy. You know, there's always, especially after November, n November pretty much through till May, there's just all kinds of junk in the, in the teacher's lounge. And there was some donuts and I started to eat it. And I just thought, you know, I really feel strongly that God wants me to, to get healthy. And he, and not only for me, but for my family and for anybody else who, uh, in the body of Christ that I affect. Um, and so I just had that thought because I believe this something that God's been working in my heart and in my mind. And I remember the, those words, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And it just shifted my focus. Okay, yeah, this tastes good, but, but it also goes against what God is working in my life right now. Now, the next part, um, uh, uh, I'm sure, you know, guys, you can't relate to this, but occasionally I say something um, to annoy or upset my wife. I'm sure that you guys don't ever do that, but, um, you know, sometimes I'm closer to 99% correct in our arguments. Um, and sometimes often I'm closer to 1%, uh, correct in our arguments. Um, but really if my goal is to bring glory to God, and to serve him and to help him with his kingdom come, his will be done, whether I'm closer to, you know, 99%, 1% or somewhere in the middle, correct? It really doesn't matter. I need to be able to swallow my pride or, you know, put aside my offense so that I can help God to, to accomplish those things. Unity in God's will is, is what really matters. Um, so how important is, is God's will to us? Um, how important is bringing glory to his name? How important is working with him to make his kingdom come and, to, and working with him to make his will be done? It, if this is really, really important to us, it will greatly dictate how we respond to our spouse, to our children, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and even to non-believers, and even to the own thoughts that we have in our, you know, that pop into our brains. Um, God's will was so important to Jesus that he said, not my will be done, but your will be done. He prayed those words to, to our father, even when he knew what was coming. And Isaiah 52, 14 says, just as many, just as many of you were astonished, I'm sorry, just as many were astonished at you, so his appearance was marred more than any other, more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. Though he knew that was coming, he still said the will of the Father was still that important that he said, not my will be done, but your will be done. And um, if you take a just a moment to think about that, that's compared to what we give up on a daily basis, it's not even, um, not even close. Another area um, that this is, really, really important. I've kind of 
already touched upon a little bit, is division in the body of Christ. Division in the body of Christ, not always, but often is related to not having our mind on God's interest, but on our own. I've seen marriages in the body of Christ, friendships, and even amongst leaders torn apart, and it, at least from the outside, and I'm not saying that this is true every time, but often it seems like neither one of them is really concerned about God's interest. They're more concerned about how they were offended or how it affects their life. And one thing that I thought was pretty neat, I, I remember seeing this sometime in the last two years, reading through, um, through the Acts and through the epistles. In Acts twenty two twenty five, 25, you know, Paul's about to get beaten and he, he makes use of his Roman rights. He, he asks the guys, you know, are you, uh, I don't remember, I'm not quoting, but basically are y'all in the habit of, you know, beating Roman citizens? And um, he, 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 what I got out of that was he makes use of his, Roman, uh, his rights as a Roman citizen for the will of God. But in 1 Corinthians 9, 12, he's writing to the Corinthians and he says, Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. And so that's just a, a great example of, you know, he could have, in that, in that case, he's not 99% right. He would be 100% right to use his right his God-given right to, to get the, I believe it was financial help from the uh, Corinthians. But he decided that the gospel of Christ was more important than him getting, uh, than him taking advantage of, of his rights. So we're almost done. Um, and this is kind of a, this is a perfect example, uh, in quotations, a perfect example of somebody um, who came to understand that life was not all about his own glory, uh, but instead was about doing God's will for God's glory. And so give me just a second to bring this up. Hopefully the audio will play good. This is kind of an older movie. Uh, not that old, but just a, f a little over a decade. But hopefully it'll be humorous and help to uh, make the point that I'm getting across tonight. Like what? Where were you last night? To tell you the truth, I went to a wrestling match. Lucha Libre. You went to watch a wrestling match? Kind of. You are a man of the cloth. Lucha Libre, it's a sin. But why? Those men fight for vanity, for money, for false pride. Yes, it's terrible, terrible. But is it always a sin to fight? No. If you fight for something noble, or for someone who needs your help, only then will God bless you in battle. Pray for forgiveness. Excuse me, Ignacio. Precious Father, why have you given me this desire to wrestle and then made me such a stinky warrior? Have I focused too much on my boots and on my fame and my stretchy pants? 
Wait a second. Maybe you want me to fight and give everything I win to the little ones who have nothing, so they can have better foods and a better life. Yeah, maybe that. Okay, if I win tonight at the Battle Jam, I will know that you blessed my mission and that you want me to be a wrestling servant of you. I smell cookies. <laughs> Okay, well, that's that, and that's the end. Well, hold on a second, almost the end of the teaching. We got two more slides, that's it. Um, so again, I just wanted to uh, restate the, the goal of the objective was that our attitudes and our actions would be permeated and consumed by, by these truths. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And just some questions for discussion uh, and hopefully for prayer. Um, these questions are not meant to bring, you know, condemnation, but rather that our, that our attitudes and our actions, again, would be permeated by the, the, this attitude that I've been discussing. Um, and the questions are, you know, how does this apply to your life today? Uh, what areas of your life has me, Christianity, uh, or modern day Christianity, interfered? or is interfering with the will of God in what areas is it doing that? And what is competing or has competed for your faithfulness to, to our father and to our Lord? Um, and how can you continue to be faithful uh, in spite of that? So that is that. And so I guess, should I go ahead and hit the stop share button? Yeah, go ahead. And, uh, yeah. Stop sharing. Okay. And Dustin, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I think it gives us a lot of really, really good things to be reminded of. And, and I appreciate you doing that. These are, um, I, I, uh, apart from the video, uh, you have a very like no nonsense way of, uh, of teaching, which is good. I like it. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, so my question is that, um, you know, I've, I've noticed that I've, throughout my life, I've tried to help people to discern the right and the wrong thing to do. And sometimes I feel like I might have a little bit more insight on what the right or the wrong thing to do is because I have um, spent a little bit more time professionally studying the Bible than others. And uh, what I've noticed is that uh, sometimes some people don't want to hear that. Either they're, they're just convinced in their own mind that they're, they're right um, or their favorite church or their favorite tradition has told them otherwise or, or whatever. And, you know, I'm thinking of, of the passage where, you know, Peter, you know, said, you know, Lord, don't do this. Jesus said, hey, I'm going to, you know, be crucified and, you know, be killed. And, you know, Jesus said, get behind me get behind me Satan or get behind me adversary, you know, Peter could have walked away and said, well, gosh, Jesus, you're a jerk, you know, like, and you know what? I, I bet if I were to say to some people, Hey, you know, like kind of forcefully like that, which is just, it's, it's just a rebuke. It's a godly rebuke and it's, it's strong, but it's done in love. And Jesus spoke the truth, but there are a lot of people today that would just say, Oh, I don't have to listen to that person because he's just being a jerk. And, you know, I just, I, I wonder how can we, because here's the thing, like it's, um, we could all just tell ourselves a certain thing over and over and convince ourselves that what we're doing is right. Okay. Um, and then if, if the thing is, I mean, I could do that and everyone else here could tell me that I'm wrong and I could just say, nope, I know what's right. Everyone else is wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. And I would be wrong because that's not how the church functions. So how do we collectively get to a point to where we can be doing the will of God, you know, be participants in God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, um, and even being open to other people, maybe correcting us a little bit without us being so thin-skinned and offended and just turned off to anybody telling us what to do? Like, how can we... Um, you know, 
the point, the point is we can only do what you're telling us to do if we are humble and meek. Um, you know, how, how do we collectively as a group become that? Well, th that's a great question. Um, and I'm sure that there might be some more inside. I know for me, one of the things I'm thinking is um, some people are just ready to hear it and some people just aren't. I mean, I, I can definitely say there was, there's been times in the past when I wasn't ready to hear it. Um, perhaps somebody has a little bit more insight along those lines. Um, I know one of the things is if you keep, you know, what makes this kind of teaching hard is when it, when it becomes personal to you. It's really, it's not that hard to, to hear about, you know, we need to focus on being faithful to God and be faithful to Jesus as long as my stuff is not out on the table. Where I'm not being faithful or where I'm struggling to be faithful is not out on the table. Um, and so, but if, but for one, I mean, I can honestly say, I think one, maybe I just wasn't really ready to hear it when I was a younger Christian. But two, honestly, some of these verses, like, you can't be my disciple if you don't do these things. You, you just can't. Um, those scriptures that are the word of God, that are God's will, are not often taught. So I think, you know, you hear those verses, and whether you like them or not, they do something to, to, to your heart and to your mind. And God is able to, to use those to, to begin to pull away or break away at some of that um, some of that pride and some of that stuff that makes us insecurities perhaps or fear that makes us so easily offended anybody else excellent teaching um, I agree um, but, um, yeah, actually, God has been pulling on my heart for a long time in different areas. Uh, it's just getting clear on what to do and not wasting time. You know, because time, time, we can't get time back. Anything else, maybe we can, but not time. Um, <clears throat> you know, I know that God's got to be working in everybody's heart on this line concerning these things. I just know that because he's called us to a high calling and we're supposed to fulfill that calling to the best of our ability. And we are supposed to please him, not just ourselves. And we're not here to please the world or anyone else contrary to God. We're here to please God in every way we possibly can. And that's, that's a heart desire in my own life. But I know there's areas where, I need clarity on just exactly what to do right now. I've been dealing with some physical issues. I want to get over this crap because it's holding me back from doing some things that I really believe God wants me to do. Um, and I guess, you know, everybody's has those issues in certain areas. So, you know, that's my two cents, but no, this was an excellent teaching. I've read those scriptures before, and they're very convicting. Jesus Christ didn't cut any ice. He was straightforward on what he said. He was the perfect example. He never allowed anything, not one thing, to get in his way. He had nothing but the clothes on his back. That's what he owned. Uh, because he trusted God for everything. What an amazing example that is. So my comment, um, I did the experiencing God uh, Bible study with John and a few others. And um, I think one of the things we want to do God's will, it just in general, I think every Christian is like, yeah, I want to do God's will, no problem. But are you willing to give up your comfort, your life, your opinions, your desires, your wants, uh, 
rearrange everything to do God's will. I think we're like, yeah, I want to do God's will on my time off, on my day off that doesn't affect everything else that I want to do. And I think there's just a huge difference. If you think about what Jesus did, he, uh, you know, when you were speaking and you said, just pause for a moment and think about <laughs> what he did. He wanted God's will to be fulfilled so much. And he knew he was going to be so badly beaten and tortured and killed. I mean, half the time we're not even like, well, I don't want to give up my donut or I don't want to give up my, you know, soccer game on Saturdays with my guys. I don't want to give up. Hello. We're not even close to giving up what Jesus gave up for God's will. And how many of us, you know, every morning when we wake up, go, okay, God, what's the list of, what's the to-do list today? What do you want? No, we wake up and go, okay, I need to do this. I, I need to do this. I need to make sure I get this done. And it's all I, 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 and what I want. And we forget, you know, <laughs> to really prioritize your whole life around God's will, I think is just something, especially in our society that is, it, it's totally going against the grain and it's going against how our society set up and our life and our daily, our daily activities. But really it's a huge deal to, to change your thinking to be that way. Sure. You need to go to the grocery store at some point. I get that. You need to do laundry, but doing it in, in God's priorities and his timing and with his will. And it's amazing when you see the difference of aligning what you do every day with what God wants you to do versus what you think you should do. Um, it, it's amazing how, how much more satisfying and fulfilling it is and how much more you can actually get done. There was a time when I was really struggling with, you know, what society's pressures on like, Oh, in order to have a successful day, you need to do X, Y, Z. And it took me a lot to be able to just go, okay, I'm going to forget about X, Y, Z, you know, which things like grocery shopping, paying bills, like things that are needed to get done. And I just went, okay, God, show me my actions. What do I do first today? And it was amazing because I got five times more done than I could have just doing what I wanted. And yet, you know what? God still worked in all those things that I actually needed to do, like grocery shopping or pay bills or you know, the life necessities. It's so cool when, when you do, when you do what he wants his way and his will, he'll take care of all that other stuff too. It's not like God's will. And then excuse me, God, give me a minute. I need to take care of my life. No, he wants to take care of us too. And it's now I'm not saying I'm perfect. I do not do it all the time. I'm not saying, Oh guys, listen to me. This is how I do it. Cause that's not it at all. I, I fail at this regularly. Um, <laughs> but if you think about not having God's will just be what you do in your free time. The impact that I think it could make on so many people's lives and on, you know, if we had hundreds or thousands of people living that way, oh my gosh, imagine what life would be like. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Dustin, you had your hand up. Yeah, I thought I saw some other people have their hands up before me. I, do you want to go over them? Yeah, first? yeah. Oh, it looks like yeah. LaShondra has her hand up. Do you want to grab her? Just come, come to me last. Uh, Sergio, um, thank you for your your teaching. I appreciate it. I had a meltdown yesterday, and I think this ties um, into it, trying to um, just be faithful and um, keep God's will at the um, forefront of, of my life. We all know how difficult it is, and, and it was not easy for, for Jesus, so surely it's, um, you know, it's not easy for us either, but I just want to circle back to a question that, um, that Dustin asked um, earlier, and I guess I should have um, um, answered, it, answered it then, but I believe your question had to do with how do we talk to people who um, we know that, um, that what they may be doing is not God's will, or how do we um, you know, talk to them to put them on the on the right track. I hope that I have your um, your question um, correctly, correct. But um, I think it's really really difficult to to um, to do that because we live in a society and a culture where 
Um, it's all, everyone has their own truth, their own story, everyone's different. So, you know, my path may not be your path and what might be okay for you is not okay for me and it's all relative. So, um, you know, come at, if you try to speak to someone from a, um, a biblical perspective or um, because you, you know, um, because you've studied and you know, and you're trying to explain to the person that, hey, what you're doing is wrong and here's the path you should take. It's difficult because, um, you know, that person um, will get offended and say, hey, you know, what I do in my life is different from yours. So I understand that. But I also understand that um, for me, the easiest way um, to reach people is to try to a common ground with them and to understand that even though you may know the correct answer you may be may not be the right person to deliver it. my i'll tell the story quickly um i remember when i first got baptized not when i first got saved but when i first got baptized and i was just so excited and i wanted to convert everybody and i wanted to to convert my my uncle who at the time was um, an alcoholic, who well, still is. I don't keep in contact with him a lot, but um, just a lot of things. I love him very much, and I just wanted him to change and tell him about God and about Jesus. And, and he told me, he said, you know, you're, you don't understand my plight. You don't understand what I've been through, what I'm going through. You don't understand the struggles that I have. And although I know, I know that you mean well, but you don't understand. So you can't convert me. And I didn't understand it then, but I understand it very much now that um, I, want, I may want him to do the right thing, but because I have not walked a mile in his shoes, it's hard for me to try to change him. Whereas someone who has been in his shoes and done what he's done and understands what he's gone through, but yet, but God, but Jesus has changed him and changed his life, that person may be able to deliver the message better than I can. So um, I don't know if that, um, that answers um, the question the question or not, but um, as much as we want to try to to help the person, maybe we're not the right person to to deliver the message. And maybe our job is just to simply pray and maybe put them in contact with someone who can um, reach them at where they are and at their level. So, so I wanted to answer that. Thanks for sharing. Um, I'm not. I'm not seeing everybody's uh, hand up. I only saw Dustin's. Who else had their hand up? Melissa Bonnie had her hand up at one point. I did, but it's been covered, so I don't have any extra thoughts. Um, the only thing I would say is, Dustin, um, I'm just gonna going to give you encouragement to continue exactly with what you're doing and um, there will be a lot of fruit. Um, it Sometimes people are resistant because, you know, they have some pride and arrogance to overlook and some more humility is, is needed. So um, that's where prayer comes in and, and eventually they will hear and as Sean so aptly pointed out, um, Sometimes, uh, even though um, you've got the right words, it's somehow um, just coming from you isn't working, but somebody else can come along and, and uh, definitely say something that is exactly the same, but somehow um, it's received. So that's your prayer, is that somehow some, somebody will get through to that person. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Melissa. So, somebody else had their hand up that maybe I missed? Do you know we're still recording? Yeah, why don't, why don't we go ahead and stop the recording? Okay, sounds good. So is that 
Yeah, hit the little stop button. Cool.